All right, everyone, we are back here on the Ramp Podcast with Steve Travellini out of Boston. Steve, great to have you on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Danny. Glad to be here. For sure. Well, before we jump into our same five questions, as a reminder for our audience, save five questions to get an apples to apples comparison of everyone. The audience certainly wants to know, who is Steve Travellini? I am the Chief Revenue Officer at Link Squares, Boston-based legal tech company. Yeah, that's me, I guess. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, without further ado, we're going to jump into the questions. I'm excited to know in our discussion before, we feel very energized by this new population of folks entering into the sales profession, skills as the new currency, and folks coming from all walks of life entering into sales. So I'm really, really pumped to give our audience some, some of your perspective and have you share with them some of the things that have influenced your perspective on sales as well. Yeah, it sounds great. I'm looking forward to it. Sweet. All right. So question number one, what is the best investment an early career salesperson can do for themselves and why? I think the best investment, I'll speak from my own experience, uh, uh, is finding a leader that you believe in. Someone, someone whose style is one that you'd like to emulate, someone whose career path is similar, the one that you would like to pursue. Obviously, aligning yourself with people that have done similar things to what you would like to do is almost like too much of a common sense type of move, but I see too many people oftentimes find themselves with leadership that they don't believe in, who have taken a far different type of career path than the type of path that they would like to personally take. So I think that's the best investment that you can give yourself early is to align with that type of leadership. Yeah, that's that's super helpful. And if you don't mind expanding upon that a little bit, so in the early career, some context, right? So early career folks generally feel like that level of anxiety, like I got to get a job, I got to get to the next, I got to do it fast. How do you make sure that you're putting yourself in the best position to align yourself with a leader like that? Or just list some steps out of like what you should look for, especially when you're in all that, all that early anxiety over finding a job as fast as you possibly can. Yeah. So I think finding a job a, a, as fast as you can is one mindset that you can take. I don't think you should be incredibly quick on finding the first job that pops up, but it's making sure that you take advantage of and know what type of opportunity you're looking for so that you can jump on the right one quickly. And, and when I was hearing how you were putting it at the beginning there, it's everyone feels this pressure to get ahead fast, fast, fast. And like I said before, if, if that's truly your priority, find leadership that has done that because they'll have the fast, fast playbook. But if you're not motivated by moving at, at total lightning speed through your career, through these different stages, which are also valuable in their own way, what is it that you personally value, right? Like, what do you want to actually do? What actually gets you excited? And then find leadership and find a team that's going to empower you to do that versus just worrying about getting to like a VP of sales role as fast as possible. Maybe that's really not where you should be putting your focus at this point. Yeah, it makes sense. So take the time to identify what you care about up front and then go after only businesses or only jobs or only career paths that set you up for those desires over the course of your career. Yeah, absolutely. You should have a general direction that you want to be headed, right? If you want to be going north, that means you could have a loose destination in mind. Uh, if you want to go north, go north. Don't go, don't go south, right? If you go northwest, that might be exactly where you want to be. If you go Northeast, that might be exactly where you want to be. But if you don't have it outlined as the general direction that you want to go in, you're never going to truly feel like you're the one uh, driving your path. You're going to feel almost as if you're being kind of ping pong balled around. And I think that's what happens to a lot of people. And then five, 10 years goes by and they wonder like, why am I in this spot? Well, how much thought did you put into the general direction that you wanted to go in? Oftentimes the answer isn't much. Yeah. That's so true. Really, it's just like set your intention ahead of it. Don't just get a job to get a job. It's really, it's so easy to talk about, so easy to say, but so hard to, to do in real life, especially when you do, you're thinking about so many different things in your early career, like how am I going to impress? How am I going to move up? What's it like to be in a company? I, I haven't been in a company before. So just setting that intention is critical. Yeah. And, and be committed to the direction. Don't be committed to the exact destination that, that you mapped out, right? Things Things don't always go the way that you think, but if you're going in the general direction that you had set out for, it's going to all be all right. Yeah, that's great advice. Great advice. Moving on to question number two, how has your view on sales changed over the course of your career? And why do you think that's happened? Yeah, my, my view has changed a lot. A BDR to an account executive 
again as a manager, again as a director, then a VP of sales, then as a CRO. I think in the very beginning, the focus is on making money and it's a visceral profession. It's hard to not feel alive when you're an early, early career sales rep and every deal matters so much. And that starts to shift as you become more comfortable in your skill set and the focus becomes on developing people, the way that you think about the world and, and selling changes pretty dramatically. And as you continue to kind of rise up through the ranks and, and take on a role that's less about new business, which is the path that I took, and you're more focused holistically on, on customer revenue, both new and existing, your perspective shifts again. I think that the biggest takeaway that I have is that every stage of selling and sales leadership and revenue leadership is incredibly challenging in its own way. I think being a BDR account executive is every bit as hard as being a CRO. It's just all about the perspective that you have and the experience that you have as you're facing those challenges, right? I have a whole different level of experience and perspective now in my role, but you know, I think back on how difficult it was to be a account executive on a day-to-day -day basis, just hitting quota. And I don't think it's much harder. It's just, it's just very different. Yeah, it's great. It's great perspective. Oftentimes it just takes a little bit to like learn what sales primary function is within a business too. And you don't always get that. I know I for, I for sure did not have that coming out of school ahead of my first, my first IC role at Groupon. I didn't even know what sales was really. I didn't know that, that you could be a salesperson or that people ended up having a role like this where you're constantly communicating with others. I kind of thought you'd be sitting at a desk on an Excel spreadsheet. That, that was my image in my head of work. And then the other thing that comes to mind is when you're when you're taught about sales or when you when you view sales from the outside, oftentimes you have this image of what a salesperson should be. And I think you just broke it down really clearly. Like you don't have to play that role. There are tons of different functions, tons of different ways sales is involved in an organization and opportunities for you to think or even act within a sales org. So very, very interesting perspective there as well. Yeah, totally. I think a revelation for me was was just how broad sales is, professionally speaking. I, I think when you're uh, first thinking about sales, you might think about telemarketers or or car salesmen or women, and and it's great professions, and there are, there are tons of talented folks working in those areas. But selling two products in software and technology can be night and day different, right? One can be an SMB sale versus enterprise, and and I, I think there is if if someone's committed to being a great seller, someone in in sales in general. There is the right seat for that person somewhere. And, and just to have one bad experience in sales or experience one sale or wasn't the ideal fit for you, I mean, there's an ocean of different sales opportunities that are out there. So, so yeah, I agree. Yeah, for sure. Gets a bad route. I think we're slowly, the org, the function is slowly coming out of it, but it still gets that Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, Wolf of Wall Street, smooth talking, MO, and I don't, in my experience, I really haven't had many folks act like that. There's, there's, there's always some, but within tech organizations more specifically, I don't always see folks like that. And I don't think that there's a, there's a place for that. You can be that type of salesperson, all, all great. But the vast majority of sales or sales folks that I run into are not that out. You can be introverted, extroverted. You could be exceptional at, at schmoozing. You could be totally ROI numbers driven to all shapes and sizes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and we take a non-traditional approach to talent and, and sellers at Link Squares. We have lobstermen, we have accountants, former teachers, all different walks of life kind of coming into sales. I think you hit the nail right on the head. It's always such different personalities and it's so hard to predict which is going to be best as it translates to performance. But those movies that you outlined, they do have their fun parts, but most of them are fairly depressing. Yeah, <laughs> Glenn right. Gary, I, I remember watching that it's like a depressing dark film i don't know why that would motivate anybody to go into sales it's like all these miserable folks and i think i do think that else is changing for the better and it's not it's not like that 100 percent, 100 percent. moving on this question is always an interesting one to hear about but what is one mistake that you made early in your career that shaped the way you operate today and how has it shaped you yeah i think in my first job out of school I was learning a lot about the world and myself, and I wasn't always on. And and that sounds that sounds that sounds a little out there, maybe a little hard or something like that. But realistically, I wasn't always on my A game. I had wavering commitment. I would have periods where I would be incredibly focused and productive. 
And then I would totally take my foot off the gas and my focus would be somewhere elsewhere entirely. And I think the learning was that despite those, those bursts of activity and promise that I had in the earlier stages of my career, people really remembered those moments where I like totally took my hands off the wheel and, and, and lost focus. And it's, it's really important to know that the consistency of your efforts and your focus really start to build your reputation. And when I had a fresh start in my second sales job, I, I did staffing in the early portion of my career, first five years, and then I switched into tech, technology sales. That was really my moment where I was ready to turn a corner and it really did change the entire trajectory of my career. I remember incredibly thoughtful about who I wanted to be and how I wanted to be perceived and what I wanted my reputation to be. And, and I was conscious uh, uh, of that and kind of designed it and tried my best to hold myself accountable. And just being mindful of that, I do really think made all the difference on the days where I would be tempted to take my foot off the gas a bit or lose focus. There was a voice somewhere reminding me that once you do compromise your reputation, it's hard to get it back. So for, for sellers that are out there in a new job or, or ex exploring one, I'm sure that that can resonate with you. Who do you want to be in your next gig? How you're going to help, how are you going to hold yourself accountable to it? I think if you're mindful about it, it could really, it could really set you on a great path like it did for me. Yeah. Thanks for sharing and going a, a layer deeper there. It's interesting that you say that and very thought provoking for a, no, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is in our audience, there's a ton of folks who are getting into, let's call it their second act or third act. We have teachers and nurses and folks who potentially worked in retail looking to jump into new careers as salespeople, either in tech or otherwise. What was your mindset going into that? Was there like a, a specific instance or decision you made where I was, where you were like, hey, look, it's time for me to snap out of it or time for me to grow up or think through this or be intentional about that, that brand, your personal brand, your, your personal standing or reputation. Is there just like, or it was just like a bunch of little things leading to, Hey, it's time for me to make this change. Yeah. It, it, it's yeah. It's definitely always a combination of many small things. I think But when you ask the question, there's one memory that jumps out for me where I'm driving with my girlfriend at the time now my wife, and we're having, we were having conversations as we often did in that period of time about the future and what we were going to do. And I, I had this real negative, pessimistic view of my current situation. And it wasn't too productive, right? A complaining would be the best way to sum it up. And I remember her being very direct with me. I obviously trusted her more than anybody. And she, she told me like, this isn't who you are, right? If you're truly this unhappy, about your current situation, find the thing that's really going to make you happy. Like I know who you are. You're an incredibly like motivated, ambitious person. And when you get cranky and negative like this, typically means you're doing something that uh, you probably shouldn't be doing and you want to take on the next challenge. So she, she kind of pushed me out of the nest, just kind of dragging my feet on making a change. And she really helped encourage me to explore what the possibilities could be. And I think that was the beginning, right? Because I saw an her tone and the way that she confronted me on it, basically, uh, uh, she was looking at me wasn't the way that I even wanted her to be looking at me. So I realized that there was probably a lot of room for growth and change there. And as I did the interviews and explored that shift, I, that's where I started to take that mental catalog, I think, of who I was and, 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 and where I wanted to be and, and who I wanted to become. And the rest is history. Nice. That's awesome. And thanks for sharing that conversation, that pivot point too. It reminds me a bit of what I went through. One of my last gigs as an operator was just, I had it in my head for the longest time. It was probably 10 years that I just wanted to start something, wanted to be an entrepreneur, wanted to build a company. And I remember a conversation with my mom, who's super successful, runs a big private accounting firm in Minnesota. And I called her, it was pretty much like, hey, like this is driving me crazy, super, super negative about the current situation. Like, this, this place is driving me crazy, almost asking for permission to quit. And she just kind of stopped mid track and was like, why are you asking me if you should quit? Just quit and figure it, figure it out. You're going to be fine. <laughs> You've always been fine. It's going to work. And it was like that moment where I just kind of realize like I don't view my view of myself and 
the world's view of myself, they don't line up today and I need to either make that happen or I'm never going to do it. So it reminds me a lot of that situation where you just got to, you just got to, somebody's just got to give you that little nudge. It's not even the big, a, a, a huge kick. It's just like, just get moving, get the, have the ball start rolling downhill a little bit. Right. Yeah. No, they sounded like very similar situations for sure. Well, cool. I really, really appreciate you jumping in on that. Next question is one of reflection as well, but who has had the greatest impact on your career and expand if you're willing as well? It's a great question. I've been incredibly fortunate in my career to have many great mentors. It, it'll be hard to narrow in on just one. I think that there's been a lot of luck actually by how I've bumped into some of these individuals along the way. I was fortunate to have uh, parents that were great role models for me on, on what hard work looked like and and very optimistic, positive folks, a lot of belief about what you could do, which was great. One of my earliest sales role models that I really looked up to, her name is Patty Flaherty. She was a vice president at the staffing company that I was at. And I just thought she was so cool. She was so good at her job and she taught me a lot. Chris Essler was a pivotal figure in my life when I made the transition into tech sales. He taught me so much and, and I worked so hard for him. And as a result, I, I was given a lot of opportunity. But I would say some combination of those types of folks and many others that I'm probably forgetting to mention now. I think finding mentorship at all different types of people over the years has been a reason I have been able to uh, kind of get to where I've been able to get to is like everybody from, from sales reps that I worked alongside. I mean, I learned so much from them and people that I'm hiring now. I'm learning so much to you know, people that are so talented. I don't have a great answer for you. I've just been really lucky to be surrounded by you know, so many influential people, but maybe that maybe that's it, right? Maybe it's it's taking a perspective of just being grateful for the people that you're around whenever and whatever stage that is in your career uh, and trying to find those people. You know, that's been something that I've been active in, right? It's great. Yeah, it's it's really it's really nice to hear that you can learn from folks too, not just folks who came ahead of you, but folks who you hire or maybe report into you. Always good to to know that you can learn anything nearly from anyone. And as long as you're continuing to put yourself to surround yourself with great people, either directly or even indirectly too, sometimes you can learn by just studying somebody and studying their actions and listening to them talk, listening to podcasts or YouTube videos. It's so easy to find great influences today. So, but it is about just finding those folks who you continue to strive to be and take a little bit from each person. So very, very good. Yeah. And, uh, and you always remember that, that first kind of sales job where you're, you know, where you're around some, some superstars, you're like, damn, that person just had it. Like, I will remember the folks at group on like that. So fondly the the superstars there for sure. Absolutely. Last question. We've asked this same question of every single guest on all three seasons. If you could go back in time now that you have the benefit of hindsight, what advice would you give yourself as you are entering into your career and why? You're not as good as you think you are. <laughs> I was kind of cocky in the early days, right? And I think it took me years, two, probably two years to come to terms with what I wasn't, what I was, and what I was was someone who is willing to work incredibly hard for extended periods of time. What I wasn't was the finished package. I, I didn't have it all together. I didn't, I didn't know what I didn't even know. I didn't even think that way for, for quite some time. I think that becoming a student of the game, aspiring to be a novice is something that Chris Essler taught me, right? That it, that's not, it's not weakness to be a, a rookie. You don't have to try and overcompensate it, uh, overcompensate for it. Realistically, um, those were turning points for me, I think. So if I could talk to that 22, 23 year old, I would ask him to be more humble and to get over himself faster. Because it's at those exact moments where you let the ego go and you just focus on getting better and you focus on doing things for the right reasons and you get all that head trash out of the way. That's where the real progress started to happen. And I was fortunate that I had strong people in my life that were able to help kind of corral that energy, get me into a more productive state. I wish I just got there sooner. 
Yeah, that's great. That's great. Thanks for sharing. And and not often advice that you want to hear when you're that age too, or that time in your career. I, I think I was I was fortunate. That moment for me came actually in college. Uh, my first econ 101 test, and I was trying to get into business school at the time. And uh, I was a, a math whiz in high school. It just it just came really really easy to me. And I I assumed like okay, econ's somewhat mathematical. I'll be fine. Didn't study for the test. Just 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 did it the same way in high school. And I got smacked in the face with like a terrible terrible grade on the first midterm. And then the world came crashing down. Like. I'm not going to get into business school. This is, this is the, I, I don't know what, what's going on. What the hell? Like I thought I was smart and then had to really work it, work at it to get the grade I wanted to and ultimately got into business school. But it was that moment I realized there are no handouts, no handouts anymore. The, the world is coming for you. And I think even more so in the professional workplace, like no one's going to sit there and, and, and babysit you, or it's not going to come easy. You got to seek out the right folks and you got to humble yourself. And I love how you put it with the, the aspire to be a novice or the, the novice mind, that's that's a really good way to put it. Because again, it goes back to learning from anybody. You can really learn from anybody. You're not the expert in, in everything, every time. There's always going to be people that know more or know it differently and you can learn from them. Yeah. And I think it's especially true when you make the transition from being an individual contributor to a manager. You have yeah. to remember what that was like, learning that and how difficult it was and what it means to be a novice. Because you're always new at something, right? And being new at managing people is every bit as hard as being new at sales. Uh, uh, it's just very different. <laughs> very different. Very different. Well, Steve, this has been a great conversation. Wrap in with this. Where can people find you? Where can they reach out to you and tap into your knowledge? Oh, just find me on LinkedIn. Anybody that DMs me on LinkedIn is always going to get a response. I love hearing from folks and uh, I can be of help. Just let me know. Sweet. Well, Steve, Steve Travellini out of Boston. Really, really appreciate your appearance today on the Ramp Podcast. This has been so informative. Love how you broke it down point by point and really got into the details on what it was like, how it, was, how it felt in your early part of your career. People are going to love it. And the episode is going to be super, super strategically and tactically important to a bunch of folks. So thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely, Danny. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Have a good day. Talk soon. 